Good afternoon. I want to thank you all for tuning in to, uh, today. My name is Amy Liu and I am Vice President at Brookings and I lead the Metropolitan Policy Program here. And I am delighted to host a conversation with two dynamic mayors about their vision for their cities at a time when just so many issues are at stake. With us today, we have Mayor Todd Gloria of San Diego, California, who was just newly elected as mayor this past November. So congratulations, Mayor. And we also have Mayor Stephen Reed of Montgomery, Alabama, who has been in office for now for just a little over a year. Now, both these mayors represent the newest voices among those leading our cities. Both these mayors represent America's future in that both represent cities that are majority non-white, with Montgomery, a black majority city in the deep south, and San Diego, a sunbelt superstar city where more than half of local residents are Latinos, Asians, and of other mixed races. And both these mayors have similar goals, even though their respective cities have different histories and economies. Um, Mayor Gloria and Mayor Reed want their communities, for instance, to emerge from the COVID-19 recession more prosperous and more opportunity rich for all residents and all neighborhoods while embracing a more climate resilient future. This is a vision that I'm sure that many of us here on the Zoom uh, event share. The issue is how do we get there? What are the actions that these mayors are going to take? And how can state and federal policies help or even maybe even undermine their efforts? So we're gonna explore all those issues and those policy dynamics with the mayors today. But before we do, I just wanna say a few words about our program, Brookings Metro. Now in the last 25 years, our experts and our team have literally helped put cities and metropolitan areas on the economic and political map. So back in 1996, when we founded this program, urban policy was considered dead. Today, cities and their large metros are a source of dynamism and optimism and place-based strategies are becoming more commonplace in state and federal policies, which are simply critical today given how we need to address the pockets of advantage and disadvantage that now dot the American landscape. So in the coming months, you're gonna hear more from us about what's next for cities and American governance. For now, I'll just say this, leaders like Mayor Reed and Mayor Gloria will be charting America's future. They and their many partners, whether it's business, civic, nonprofits, university, philanthropy, they work together every day putting community over party to do the work of a nation. They are addressing racial equity by investing in black and brown talent, businesses and communities. They are trying to replace neighborhood segregation with wealth creation. They are prioritizing quality jobs and connecting a rapidly diversifying workforce to those jobs. They are reimagining the future of the built environment which must be more dense, more walkable, more equitable, more sustainable. And they are helping their firms, their industries and their workers adapt to new technologies so we can collectively expand opportunity. This is just not easy work. Yet local is the one level of governing in our American Federalist system that never stops moving on these objectives, even when higher levels of governing can come and go as reliable partners. And there's no doubt our system of democracy is being tested and we need all levels of governing to work and to work better together. Through it all though, we simply ought to help coalitions of local and regional le leaders be more effective and create more nationally significant change to further America's promise. So without further ado, let's get this conversation going. So please help me welcome Mayor Gloria, Mayor Reed to our virtual stage. And while we have them, I also wanna say that um, I'm grateful that we have a lot of great questions from the audience um, and we will try to get to them at the end of this conversation. You can join this conversation by using hashtag Metro Mayors 
on Twitter. And you can also send us questions uh, using that hashtag as you're listening to this conversation. So I want to start by asking you uh, questions about your home cities. Um, so both of you were born and raised in the city that you now lead. So let me start with Mary Gloria. Can you give our viewers a story that captures what is so special and unique about San Diego? Ooh, boy, I know we have an hour, but you don't have enough time in the day. <laughs> uh, you know, as only a native is, uh, I'm so proud of my hometown. Uh, in part because the story I would share with you is that of my own. Um, you know, I, I like to point out, uh, or often point it out after I was elected, the many first uh, that my uh, election to, as mayor uh, represents, the first mayor of color, the first LGBTQ mayor of our city. I uh, point on the, it's a little more specific than that. I'm the first Native American, Filipino, Puerto Rican, Dutch gay mayor of San Diego. Uh, and the way that that happens is my grandparents came from all around the country, all around the world uh, because of their military service and then stayed in San Diego. That's unique about our city. We're a proud military town. Uh, and you know, my, uh, my 23 me is reflective of our military roots and what would attract people from all around the globe to come and to stay and to build lives here. Um, I think also what is unique uh, is that my mom was a hotel maid, my dad was a gardener, and yet somehow uh, their son, the first in our family to go to college, managed to become the mayor of our city. What I think that means, Amy, is that San Diego really is a place of opportunity. Uh, and my interest in leading the city has really been about making sure that door of opportunity is open as wide as possible for as many people who are willing to work hard. And I just, uh, I think that that is in some ways unique. I recognize opportunities are not often found in some of our other cities uh, that are struggling to keep up in the 21st century. Uh, San Diego uh, is resource blessed, we're a beautiful climate. We have a lot of uh, innovation economy sectors that uh, really position us well to make good on that op opportunity message I mentioned. Um, but uh, really and truly, I think that we are a city that welcomes the world uh, to our community. We're placed here on the Pacific Rim, right on the US-Mexico border. There's an openness here uh, that's unique. And I'll end with an observation or a part of that military DNA. You know, what I find about San Diego is that if you are a newcomer here, you are often welcomed with open arms. You don't have to spend 20 years toiling in neighborhood politics in order to be on the Chamber of Commerce board. We are very open. And part of that is that we experience new military uh, uh, leadership every two years or so. They rotate in, they rotate out. And that's created a culture of openness, of receptivity, of um, you know, interest in new ideas and new personalities, new perspectives that I think gives us a competitive edge in an economy that is increasingly smaller and smaller. Where we're not competing just with our peer cities in California, but across the country and around the world. So we're a city of opportunity and, and I think I'm living proof of that. That's great. Mary Reed, what is so special about your home city, Montgomery? Well, 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 listen, the, I mean, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be on with you. And, you know, one of the things, um, you know, Brookings has been such a great resource for me prior to coming into this job. And certainly since we've uh, come in this administration and working with you and many others uh, to help us kind of reimagine uh, our city, reimagine what we can do better. Um, and listening to Mayor Gloria, he makes me uh, really hunger for the day when uh, this COVID cloud is lifted above all of us. And I can get back out to San Diego because I, I love the city, I uh, love the people and the weather there. And, um, you know, you do have a great, a great community, you know, military town. We're, we're very much the same uh, here with the United States Air Force and the Air, Wars, Air War College being here. And so we see a lot of military uh, members coming to Montgomery, uh, you know, for a couple of years due to their uh, station and trying to move up to the U.S. Air Force. And so we're, we're proud of that. But I think certainly, you know, from Montgomery's standpoint, uh, what we have is a rich history, uh, rich history uh, surrounding civil rights, uh, surrounding equality, and pushing for progress in this country. And I think when we consider uh, the things that took place here uh, in 1955 uh, with Mrs. Rosa Parks uh, refusing to give up her seat on the bus and the transformational change that impacted throughout uh, not only Montgomery and Alabama, but the rest of this nation, um, it, it is something that we reflect on quite a bit. It's something that's in the spirit and it's in the DNA, not just of those leaders uh, like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who was leading that movement as a 26 year old, uh, newly installed pastor. I had a church right uh, three blocks from city hall uh, right now, but also the hundreds of everyday people 
uh, who were part of that movement, who really spurred the change. And I think that's what we're still longing for here in Montgomery uh, is to try to change that as becoming the first black mayor uh, in our 200 year history uh, in 2019. You know, I know there's still a long way for us to go. Uh, we still have some challenges uh, ahead of us, but the spirit of cooperation with people here in the city and the community and the feeling of optimism uh, is something that undergirds me every day. And it really gives me, uh, you know, a positive sense about what we can do as a community together and bring about some of those changes that we want to see in education, uh, certainly in economic outcomes and in healthcare access. Uh, those are things that are very important here. You know, when you think about uh, the South and you think about cities like this, uh, we've had some growth centers here uh, in areas around us. Montgomery has not participated in that as much, but it's not because of the people. Uh, I think it's really because of our uh, self-imposed limitations. I think in some cases it's been because hard um, and long-standing traditions have been a challenge for us to break from. But I think with, with my election and with the coalition that we were able to build, and in particular with the partnerships that we've been forming since our administration has started, we're starting to see a, a lot of awareness uh, around the city and what's possible, not only here, but what's possible throughout the South. And I think for us, you know, there, there's a big push uh, around racial reconciliation uh, led by Brian Stevens and Equal Justice Initiative. And we're seeing that uh, from philanthropies, we're seeing that from corporations, we're seeing that from everyday people. And so we feel like we should be the hub of that conversation. We feel like we should be uh, the center of how we move forward in a progressive manner, uh, not just here in, in the city, but throughout because of what we've done uh, in the past. And, and this city has been very honest about um, some of our challenges and, and some of the things we aren't so proud of in uh, decades and centuries gone by. But I think that because of the people and because of our faith and because of our just ethos, uh, we're looking forward to overcoming that. And so uh, I'm proud to, to represent my hometown. and It's been great to, to lead it, even throughout these challenging last, um, you know, 12 months or so throughout the pandemic. Yeah, Mayor Reed, let's stay with you for a moment. And we are going to get to talking about the immediate impacts of COVID and how we're going to address that and, and move forward from there. But I want to talk about your vision for your city and your agenda. Um, you mentioned that you were the first Black mayor of Montgomery. Both of you um, actually had historic uh, elections because of that. Uh, because Mayor Gloria, you were the first uh, person of color elected to your city and Mayor Reed, the first African-American mayor to your, to your city 400 years after the first black slaves arrived in the United States. And I guess my question for you is, how are you planning to take that historic moment? What do you see is the mandate behind your election? I think the mandate is to bring about uh, not just equality, but equity. Uh, across the board and to expand the opportunity uh, for everyone, regardless of zip code, uh, background, uh, race, ethnicity, or what their last name may be. We want to provide ladders um, to opportunity in this city. And we know that we have to be deliberate and we have to be intentional and we have to be very honest about um, how we got here and why it took so long. I certainly don't think I was uh, the best person uh, to do this that could have done it. Uh, but there were racial barriers that, that stood in the way of many others. Um, and we have to be uh, very honest about acknowledging that painful past and using that to leverage us and to propel us into a more prominent future. And what we want to do is, is our thought is that starts with education. Um, we believe uh, economic uh, empowerment is very, very important. We think that we have to do a better job of supporting uh, minority and particular black owned businesses. Um, and helping entrepreneurs get access to capital, bring about a more equitable education or experience, one that has not been funded uh, in the past on a very uh, fair basis. And we also know that we have to kind of change our economic model, that we cannot just be a service and manufacturing uh, community. We cannot be one that's just based on being the, the capital of the state government, uh, but we have to make sure that we are uh, as Mayor Gloria pointed out, you know, in the knowledge-based economy that we're looking into those emerging trends and we're going out to talk about a new Montgomery 
and to change the narrative. But the history uh, that we have, again, provides a, a blueprint for me as well. And the blueprint for me as the first black mayor of the city is that there's opportunity. Uh, there are willing partners and there are people who want us to succeed. And there are people who really want us to help uh, turn the page, not just in Montgomery, but because of what it represents to the rest of this nation. And that has been you know, very fulfilling for me. And what my staff and I have been trying to do has been to try to work with many organizations on various fronts from public safety to neighborhood revitalization to affordable housing to even addressing food deserts to really bring about a more uh, fair and just approach to government and how responsive we are to our citizens because many of them, uh, Amy, for, for so long have felt left out, uh, yep. looked over and left behind. And when one looks at the things that we see on a day-to-day -day basis here, I have to agree. So we know that there has to be some right sizing in this, and we know that it takes more than government to do it. It takes more than hopes and wishes and prayers. Uh, it takes partnerships, it takes actions, and it takes deliberate intentions to get that done. Great. Mayor Gloria, I just want to stress this, what you mentioned earlier, which is that San Diego is situated right on the Mexico border. Um, it is um, a bi-national region, and it's always had great economic ties to Tijuana and Baja, California. Um, but I really was struck by something you said recently, which is the city also shares cultural and family ties to your neighbor. And here you are, after all the connections to the border, you are the first mayor of color uh, for the city. So what is the mandate for you? What is the moment? Uh, how are you planning on seizing this moment? I really appreciate that question because I do think it uh, underlines some of what Mayor Reed was just discussing in terms of uh, how much further we still have to go, right? That we can be a city that is situated uh, on the U.S.-Mexican border but have never elected anyone that looks like me to this office. And it does present opportunity to approach this a different way. My observation, uh, Amy, is that generally uh, we have talked about the border in economic terms, dollars and cents what the amount of trade and, and commerce across that uh, busy land border, uh, border uh, means for our community as well as the communities in Baja. And that's not insignificant, but I think the last four years has shown us what happens when you talk about immigration, uh, not in humanistic terms, but in, in money terms. Um, and the amount of human suffering that has happened over the last number of years and honestly continues a bit today because we're still trying to make a transition to a more humane and compassionate system and I appreciate the Biden administration's creative engagement on that. Uh, but the point is we have to talk about this more about people and about families. Recognizing that in San Diego, a lot of our folks live on both sides of the border. They may work on one side, live on the other. Uh, their children may matriculate on one side, their job may be on the other side. The point is, is that uh, the border is not a, a dividing line as much as it is uh, about um, a scene really that we have to knit tighter and closer together. And by doing so, uh, our economy does improve, but so do the outcomes for the people of our region. Um, and when I think about so many of the challenges we face as a community, when it comes to water quality, environmental stewardship, climate action, uh, energy, housing, so much of this requires a binational approach uh, that is just perhaps different than it would have seen before. Uh, we wanna get past uh, just ceremonial engagement and really into a depth of engagement that really lifts up our community Quick example would be, you know, we have a very small airport here in San Diego. Uh, it makes it very convenient when I, when I welcome Mary here uh, soon, when, the, when they can allow travel again, he'll have a quick little three minute drive to my office because it's that convenient. That said, it constricts our capacity. Well, Tijuana has an incredible uh, airport that we've been able to build a cross-border terminal where you can check in on the American side, walk across a pedestrian bridge and access the host of flights that are there, solving partially the problem that we have in the San Diego area. That kind of collaboration has the, the ability to lift up our quality of life, not just improve trade, but improve our region's quality of life. We need more of that in our bi-national mega region. Great. Let's talk about COVID-19 and its impact on your local community. Um, I want to uh, keep it with you, Mayor Gloria. And uh, as a way of opening this up, I thought it was very interesting that in your recent state of the city speech, you declared that the state of the city is quote, fragile. So can you expand upon that? Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I'm not surprised that caught your attention. I think it caught some other folks' attention. You know, you're supposed to say it is strong, it is vibrant, it's, you know, what, what have you. And 
I just believe in being honest. Um, and the fact of the matter is the pandemic uh, has hurt our economy. It has hurt our people. It has caused thousands of our folks to be sick. Uh, thousands pass away. And, um, and it has expo exposed um, other challenges the city has long faced, um, but has not necessarily spoken about. And I thought that by describing it as fragile, which I think is an accurate description, um, it was being truthful at a time where we need uh, to build trust with the public. You know, as we ask people to follow public health orders, as we ask them to believe in the science and get vaccinated, uh, they need to know that their leaders are being honest with them, leveling with them, even when the information is not something that is positive. And so when I look at our enormous budget deficit, again, Amy, a deficit that pre-existed the pandemic, but is far worse because of it, um, I have to be honest with people. And my hope is that, particularly at the beginning of a new administration, that that transparency, that honesty, um, that being really forthright, will build a level of uh, credibility with the public that will allow us to get through this pandemic uh, and then help us to actually address these longstanding issues uh, that have long been ignored, uh, but can be ignored no longer because the pandemic has made them just so much more acute. So um, yeah, not uh, an interesting word choice, one that I believe is accurate and one that I think helps me to uh, be honest with the public and hopefully gain credibility to tackle the many significant challenges that are ahead of us just to contain the virus, and then we'll have to be addressed during the recovery. We'll spend more time on the response, but Mayor Reed, I wanna give you a chance to just tell us um, what the pandemic crisis has been on your city's budget and your community. And you became mayor right at the center of um, the pandemic. Yeah, you know, the, the pandemic, um hit again just just a little bit over a year ago we probably saw that uh, preparing for it um sometime in in february kind of mid-february uh, right after actually the u.s conference of mayors when, when i was in dc is where i was first alerted to it uh by a good friend and you know for us it has been uh, difficult because it hit right in our first 100 days and we had a very ambitious agenda that we wanted to get accomplished and that you know had to be kind of put on pause but we put all hands on deck uh, in order to try to address it. And we wanted to take the approach of making sure that we were overprepared um, for whatever might come. And I think, you know, some of the things that probably helped us um, to the degree that we could was how we responded to it fiscally. We uh, implemented a hiring freeze. We cut budgets across the board 10%, which is not something I would normally do, but we thought this was a very unique scenario. And even if I wasn't... Uh, up to up to the task initially my finance director who had been here uh working for the city about 18 years she made sure uh that i understood what the implications were on some things that uh, i thought we could do and, and i think in hindsight it was certainly the best move for us so we, we saw you know revenues plummet with like a lot of cities but we were able to stave off uh any furloughs any layoffs and we didn't have to touch our reserves so we came out of this, we're coming out of this, I think a little bit better than most. And certainly we went into the 2021 budget season better than we thought because of uh, those aggressive approaches that we took. And I think you now in terms of the community, that's been a different story. You know, virtual learning has impacted uh, a lot of people uh, in this community. It's shown us the educational gap that we know is there. It has laid that out in the open for everyone to see. We tried to do what we could by uh, enabling mobile Wi-Fi units on school buses to go out to various neighborhoods. And we tried to think innovatively in ways of how we could support our small businesses, uh, raising hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to small businesses to give them as uh, grants and not loans. We really tried to work with our financial institutions, both local and those outside of Montgomery uh, to assist us in various programs. And we worked you know, with the SBA as well to get uh, small businesses and entrepreneurs uh, the information they needed, whether it was for the PPP loans or other loan programs that were out there. So we tried to do our part, but that still was not enough to uh, save all the livelihoods that we wanted to save. And, and we have seen that impact uh, along uh, our retail corridors and certainly as it has hurt uh, family businesses and businesses that have been open for generations. And finally, and I think certainly the, the most important part is that the healthcare uh, access that we've seen. Again, uh, we've seen that gap between those who have and those who have not. And that has 
often come across uh, racial lines and certainly uh, economic lines. And it's also shown us where the faults are in our public health care system and things that we have to work on, not just as a municipality or as a state, but as a nation in order to better serve our most vulnerable uh, residents and citizens. I want to spend some time talking about your relationship with your governors uh, as we've approached the, the public health crisis. Both your governors have, have come to the crisis very differently. Uh, go, you know, Governor Newsom, um, you know, clearly sh uh, had a very uh, strict shutdown of the state economy. Uh, Governor Kay Ivey um, came late uh, to masks and um, shutting down and um, probably has a very different reopening approach at this moment. Uh, tell me how that, how your relationship with the governor, uh, how did that play out during the year? Obviously, Mary Gloria, you were uh, in the state assembly actually at the time. <laughs> um, but how do you see this either both in the reopening, how did, how did the state relationship play out, uh, particularly for you, Mayor Reed? And then how do you see that partnership playing out over the next couple of months? You know, I, I think from my end, uh, the, the state capital is, is less than a mile from my office. And so we have a uh, very good relationship with our governor and uh, her chief of staff. Certainly there are many things that our politics don't agree on um, and the mass mandate was one. But we thought early on that we were gonna have to kind of go it along because even other mayors uh, in our state really weren't where we were based on the information that we had. And we just believe that we had to look out for uh, our residents and really try to set the tone and set the example of what needed to be done, irrespective of what was happening at the state level. Because as, as you know, we've talked about before in, in various forums, you know, often you have a different dynamic in particular in the South, in your urban core, in your cities politically, versus what you have throughout your state politics. And, and that in itself can, can present a challenge, and it did present a challenge for us. But we were, we were always upfront with uh, Governor Ivey. We were very transparent. She was very open to listening uh, to the mayors of the largest cities in the state. Uh, but she was hearing from uh, hundreds of mayors and, and hundreds of county commissioners and, and things along those lines. And I understood the, you know, the, the, the um, juggling act she kind of had to do. Our thought was, let's lead by example, let's set the tone and let's do what we think is in the best interest of our residents and I think we were able to do that and we saw other communities and maybe even some of our state leaders come along with that as well. Mayor Gloria. Well, as you say, uh, Amy, most of the year has been spent with me uh, serving with the governor in Sacramento, uh, working collaboratively on the state response. Now my role has shifted, but that relationship is really, I think, accruing to the benefit of San Diego. Um, you might imagine my predecessor who's now running against the governor, uh, that, 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 dimension of politics is unhelpful, right? This alignment um, in terms of a, an approach of understanding that science and data has to drive this conversation, that we need to work collaboratively to get better outcomes for our residents. That's actually, I think, working much, much better. Um, and I will just say that I am uh, grateful for Governor Newsom's leadership during this difficult year. Uh, all of us are, are burdened with leadership at this time. We all sought these jobs, so no, I'm not complaining. Uh, but my point is that this is a difficult time to be in leadership. Um, and I think it's undeniable that what the governor has done over the last year has saved thousands of lives. Um, and it has been difficult. There's no two ways about it. Uh, but what I've found with the governor is a receptivity uh, to feedback, uh, to information, to data. Um, and similarly, he has been willing to support our efforts here in San Diego. Uh, shortly after I became the mayor, we took uh, Tailgate Park, which is where uh, Petco Park, where the Padres uh, uh, play. Uh, and turned it into the state's first vaccination superstation, vaccinating 5,000 people a day on what is a city uh, parcel of land. Uh, they now have in, uh, entrusted the city of San Diego uh, to provide vaccines uh, ourselves. Uh, we are assisting the county of San Diego, who is the lead on our public health response, but we can play an assistive role in targeting hard hit communities, hard hit zip codes uh, to make sure vulnerable populations like our homeless population are served. Uh, this has been through the partnership with the state of California and the county of San Diego. Again, saving lives at a time that is so critical. And Amy, on a go-forward basis, I'm extremely optimistic of what we can do with the state that, frankly, because of smart fiscal stewardship by Governor Brown before him and continued under Governor Newsom, they have a substantial budget surplus that I think will be able to find its way down to cities like ours that have been hard hit because of lack of tourism and travel. 
and be able to use those dollars strategically to address, again, those hard hitting, difficult issues that we've long ignored, but that Governor Newsom by his own political brand has been one that has never been shying away from tough issues. So I'm hopeful, uh, Amy, and uh, I'll just maybe wrap up with one thing. Governor Newsom had a program, has a program, Project Home Key, where we have been, the state has been providing localities like the city of San Diego, millions of dollars to acquire hotels and to convert them into permanent supportive housing. So in the midst of a public health pandemic, in the midst of an economic crisis, the governor has not taken his eye off the ball of what I still hear is the number one issue for my constituents, homelessness. And what yep. we have done now is actually add over 300 units of permanent housing in months, not years, that is literally housing over 400 unsheltered San Diegans tonight. That has been done during a pandemic. I cannot wait to see what we can get accomplished after this pandemic through this improved city-state relationship. Um, since you've got the mic, let me just follow up and talk about the new American Rescue Plan, the $1.9 billion trillion dollar plan that the president will soon sign. There's been some concern that state localities didn't need um, the state and local aid that has been included. Tell me, um, you know, how helpful is that aid and how do you plan to use it as well as perhaps feel free to comment on other parts of the bill package that will be helpful to you. Uh, absolutely. Well, Amy, if I could spend the next half hour praising <laughs> and thanking uh, President Biden, Speaker Pelosi, Leader Schumer. I mean, they have done something transformative and incredible. You know, Amy, right now, every one of my city firefighters is capable of providing COVID vaccinations. And they're doing that. They're doing that at our municipal gym. They're doing it at our city libraries. They're on mobile units going out and vaccinating senior citizens who are not able to make it to vaccination stations. They have done this in a pandemic, setting aside their own health and getting out there and doing the hard work. And at a time when I'm facing a nearly quarter of a billion uh, dollar budget deficit over two fiscal years. So the $300 million that is in the American Rescue uh, uh, Act is going to help us bridge that gap so that I don't have to tell those firefighters, those EMTs who are out helping save lives right now, that they have to take a pay cut or they have to take a pink slip. That's what Joe Biden has done. That is what Congress has done. And I'm eternally grateful. It is baloney to say that this is not necessary. It is absolutely necessary to make sure that we're not laying off librarians at a time when we need our librarians open so that people can access the computers there to find jobs, right? That we don't have to tell our homeless services providers to pack up shop and go away at a time when, again, San Diegans are pressing for, for change. This money will be extremely helpful to get through the next difficult series of months that we will face and will set us up for success now, I've mentioned our city's budget, which um, I wanna say the number one priority for these dollars is helping to defeat COVID-19. So that those vaccination efforts I just mentioned to you don't have to cease, right? Amy, that stuff is not free. And some of it's reimbursable, but some of it's coming out of our city's coffers at a time when, again, we're facing a deficit. That's job number one. Job number two is to make sure that we're not laying folks off, that we can maintain neighborhood services at a time when the public is asking for more public help. They are turning to the city, to the county, to the state for help. We have to be able to meet that uh, those calls for help. This plan will help us do that. And the last thing, Amy, is it helps us to kind of keep an eye on the horizon for what we can do going forward. You know, we have hard hit industries here, right? Our hospitality industry, our travel industry, our restaurants, our small businesses, our moms and pops. The dollars in this particular plan will allow the city to initiate programs that will actually help us to help them. So absent this uh, legislation, none of that would be happening. We would be having a very different different conversation today. And that's why, again, I would take the remainder of the time to just repeatedly say thank you to President Biden, thank you, Vice President Harris, thank you to the leaders in Congress, because I shudder to think what we would be doing as a city if we did not have this key legislation passed. Mayor Reed, why don't you jump on that and say how how will that aid package help you and your community? I mean, everything Mayor Glory just said. I mean, I I, I can't. Uh, add much to that really, really across the board as mayors. I think regardless of the, the size of our uh, cities and the size of, of the residents we're trying to serve, uh, we have very much the, the, the same type of problems. It's just a matter of scale. And it, it's incredulous to imagine that, that people don't think that um, state and local governments need that. And I know that's a great talking point for some size, but in actuality, people are hurting uh, their businesses are hurting, and I think it's up to leaders to acknowledge that, um, that this type of investment was the least 
uh, that was needed. And I think when you consider uh, the billions of dollars going to metropolitan areas and, and cities uh, directly, it cuts out some of the bureaucracy that we've had to deal with over the last year. Uh, with many of those resources going to the states and then having to fight that through our counties and then uh, our municipalities. And so I'm excited to be able to help out our, our first responders, to help out those frontline workers, um, those small businesses, to be able to give uh, more support to those businesses that have managed to hang on to help them get afloat so they can put people back to work. Um, and then when we think about the nonprofits that are helping out in so many ways that government uh, has short-circuited them over the years in the social services area, whether that is mental health, whether that is um, access to hospital and medical appointments, whether that is even looking at uh, other issues that impact people on a daily basis, being able to provide funds for those uh, organizations that have been kind of uh, standing in the breach, if you will, uh, is a benefit to all of us as mayors because government can't do it alone. Uh, yep. it, it never has. And so it needs the private sector. Uh, it needs the nonprofit community. And it needs for people to feel good about um, not only the next day, but the next week and the next month and that they're going to get help and that the leaders that they've elected are responding to their needs and responding to the things that they have had to go without uh, many cases for well uh, over a year. So I, I think the uh, stimulus is, is well deserved. Uh, for this nation. And I'm certainly uh, glad that President Biden, Vice President Harris and the Congress passed this. And I think that we will see the benefits of this uh, in the very short and long term. I want to ask you both now concrete actions you're going to take around a more equitable recovery. I know this is something you both care about. Um, I think for Mayor Reed, I just have to ask this other question first, which is very related to that. It's really hard for me not to talk about Tuskegee because the Tuskegee experiment took place in the county next to yours. Yeah. I wanna know um, how the black community in Montgomery in your community is reacting to the availability of vaccines given the history that is so close to your backyard. Sure. I think that um, the response has been positive. I was just on a call this morning uh, with, with faith leaders about this very issue and about trying to get the word out. We've also been working with Partners in Health through a community healthcare workers program, which is designed to pay uh, community leaders to go out and try to uh, educate and inform members of the community about why it's important to be vaccinated. There is some hes hesitancy because of the, the history there. Uh, there certainly has been uh, a public information campaign that we've tried to wage uh, to get people to respect um, the views and the understanding of those who are uh, suspicious of the federal government, in particular uh, because of the Tuskegee syphilis experiment here. But that you know experiment is known throughout this nation, and one of the things that we've tried to share, being right here, is we know the uh, the ups and we know the downs of that, and we certainly also understand the gap that exists between healthcare access. And so if there's one thing that I probably will point to that's been the biggest challenge, it, it is for people to get access to the vaccine. I think that we've gotten to a decent point in the skepticism that exists around whether or not it's safe. I think now it's just a matter of getting people to the point where they can actually get it. And now with uh, the Biden administration purchasing another 100 million uh, vaccines from Johnson & Johnson, along with what they already have planned, I feel much better that we'll be able to uh, narrow the gap that exists between uh, those that have been uh, have gotten access to the vaccine that are black and brown and those that are white uh, and being able to address that here in Montgomery. And I think we're over the uh, information side, but we'll continue to work on that when we run into people who are somewhat suspicious of it. Yeah. So let's stay with then beyond healthcare, what are other things that you are doing concretely to change the structure of opportunity in Montgomery that is more racially inclusive? And in fact, dismantles a lot of the systemic racism that still permeates a lot of our structures. Um, this is obviously something that's been top of mind uh, in your community for, for centuries. Well, I wanna know what, what are you doing specifically to make progress? Sure, well, the first thing we did was we passed a uh, tax increase for our public schools, which are 
overwhelmingly uh, serving um, black students. Uh, in November, this is the first time in 50 years, and we still are where we need to be for cities our size in a per student uh, basis. But we thought that was the bedrock of things that we had to do. I campaigned on it, and it's something that I wanted to do in my first year uh, in office, and we were able to overcome a lot of doubt and a lot of opposition in order to get that done because we just aren't a, a state that re reinvests a lot into uh, public institutions, regardless of what that may be. For, for some reason, uh, at some point, things that were public became poor. Um, and it almost seems that coincided with integration and it coincided with many other people getting gaining access to where then it became a handout, whereas in generations prior, it was just part of the uh, experience of getting to the next level. So we invested heavily in our public education system and we continue to do that, not just through tax dollars, but also through partnerships and collaborations uh, with companies such as Amazon, with, with Apple, Ed Farm, and others. So we're continuing to do that. But secondly, uh, we're working with Partners in Health and other um, organizations like that to address the healthcare disparities that we see. Because when we think about um, a lot of the things in, in a place like Montgomery and in Alabama, uh, it comes down along race and healthcare stands right at the top along with wages. And so those are things we're also trying to work outside in on to address whether it be infant mortality, uh, whether it be the, the level of chronic disease that exists and the disparities that exist be between people of color uh, and those that are not. We're trying to make sure that we are reaching out to those organizations as well. And then I think from the financial standpoint, uh, where we are is we're trying to do more around financial literacy uh, with various uh, financial institutions and businesses to bring about more conversation and more deliberate and intentional action uh, around economic empowerment. Again, when we think about the wage gap uh, as it's defined by race in the South, uh, there's a chasm between those that are white and those that are African-American or, or maybe uh, Latino. And so when we consider those things, we know there has to be a deliberate approach to equity and not just equality. And that means intentional and deliberate policies addressed to that. And so we've had some tough conversations uh, about how we got here and what we need to do to get out of this. And the last part we believe is very important is I'm making sure that there's a really uh, uh, sizable minority participation program that targets uh, minority and black owned businesses uh, with contracting opportunities, with procurement opportunities and explain to them the importance of, of getting bonded and explaining to them the licensing process as well as getting our financial institutions to do more. And that's important. Uh, many of our financial institutions do the bare minimum as required by uh, the, the federal government, but we're, we're urging them to do more and trying to show them that if they invest in businesses and those business owners tend to hire people from their own communities, uh, then that is going to multiply economic output. It makes business sense uh, to invest and to support minority and black owned businesses and businesses of color. And we have to make sure we do that. And we think the best way uh, for us is to make sure that we're setting an example at the city through a strong uh, minority participation program and one that really brings about racial equity and not just one that talks about racial equality. Great. We have about 15 minutes left. I wanna make sure we get through a couple uh, additional questions and those from the audience. So, but Mayor Gloria, let's talk about your vision for San Diego as an equitable city and the actions we're taking. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I've said that we need to uh, run every decision at the city through an equity lens. And we're beginning that work now. And you know, Amy would shock you probably to know how basic our work has begun. I mean, in terms of where we're at. Uh, just last week, I issued the city's uh, first report on equity in terms of pay uh, for how we compensate our employees identifying significant gaps in pay for both women and for people of color. I think some other executives might have in the past just put that in the bottom drawer and not let it see the light of day. Instead, we lifted it up. That's going back to being honest and forthright with the public to try and build uh, trust and credibility. So we put that out there and now we're going to go about the work, the difficult work. And I heard what Mayor Reed said. I'm, I'm still looking for the easy conversations in the mayor office. I haven't found one yet. They're all tough, uh, but I like doing tough work. So it's okay. But whether it's issuing that plan, uh, we are currently recruiting for our first office uh, executive director um, or chief uh, uh, officer for our office of race and equity. 
Um, so if there's a pro out there that wants to help a city understand how to integrate equity into everything that we do, uh, I know a beautiful city uh, with a new energetic administration who'd be willing to take your resume right now. We're actively recruiting. Um, and we have appointed the first African-American to our planning commission, to our water uh, board. I mean, we are still in the very basic phase of this. So, you know, putting out data, standing up a recruitment for the first office, appointing the first individuals. I'm anxious to get to the point where we start going deeper, where we start driving budgeting decisions based on equity, when we start standing up programs. I'll tell you one little glint of, of positivity. Uh, this conversation is happening over Zoom. It really illustrates uh, the need for internet access, the digital divide exacerbating the inequities that currently exist. I will tell you that we are embarking with philanthropic support to outfit uh, most of our city's rec centers with uh, public free Wi-Fi. And we're starting in our lowest income, uh, most uh, uh, concentrated communities of concern for that particular effort. The last thing I would just say, because I know we want to get to some more stuff, Amy, is that I cannot underscore how much equity is driven by housing. And the yeah. fact that the generational divide in terms of wealth creation or lack thereof really is around this. And so if I had to say, we put the virus to bed, we get the economy going back again, we have to be laser focused on housing production because while that will help everybody, I think it disproportionately will benefit those who've been shut out of the housing economy and the opportunity to buy a home and to build wealth. And while, um, while you're speaking, I want you to also elaborate on um, the role of neighborhoods and geography and how to make sure that more neighborhoods are part of San Diego's knowledge economy. Um, you talk, so talk about that and talk about, I also, I, I wanna get in here environmental. You have a really strong vision around green and equity and a climate equity fund, which I think is also spatial. So talk again, bring, bring in the notion of neighborhood investments and, and environment. Well, that's right. Like what the Wi-Fi at the rec center, right? It is, has a geographic overlay on top of that of where do we start first? Where is the need the greatest so that whatever months or years has to go between the first rec center and the last rec center is in the community where the most benefit can happen. You mentioned our climate equity fund, which the council adopted unanimously uh, on Tuesday. And it does have a spatial component. It's, it's recognizing that not every neighborhood is going to have a lot of Teslas, right? But every neighborhood has to have access to renewable energy, to clean, uh, 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 clean energy, et cetera. And so this climate equity fund is focused in the neighborhoods where we have the greatest level of environmental racism, environmental injustice, of historic disinvestment. Uh, it creates a permanent funding source. I'm not going to represent to you that the initial dollars are going to be changing the world but it's a start in a city that really is putting its first steps forward when it comes to leading uh, with an equity lens. Uh, but yeah, you know, Amy, I think a lot of cities have what we have here in San Diego. If you ask most San Diegans, the divide in our city is north of Interstate 8 and south of Interstate 8. Uh, if you talk to the people who are really in the know, they know it's south of State Route 94 is really where uh, the inequities super, are, are super concentrated. And that's why in the middle of the pandemic, where our city's mobile pop-ups are in those communities south of the 8, um, in those hard hit zip codes, because there is, as you mentioned, a spatial component to this. And I, I cannot wait to get past this emergency posture that we currently are in, and then work with employers, investors to start putting the good jobs that we have in abundance in the north part of our city and bring them in those opportunities down. I'll tell you maybe one quick story. Later this year, I will be the mayor that gets to cut the ribbon on our new Mid Coast Trolley Extension. This goes from essentially Old Town San Diego up to the University of California, San Diego. What that means, Amy, is that you'll have a one-seat ride from the U.S.-Mexico borders, the, the most southernmost neighborhoods of this city, a one-seat ride to the, one of the best public universities in the world. That is going to be transformative, and my 20-year effort to get that project uh, completed, it started when I was a young congressional staffer for Congresswoman Susan Davis. You can imagine how transformative that will be, and that should be, again, one of the initial steps towards making sure that people from the South don't have to travel to the North to access quality education and jobs, but that more of those educational opportunities and jobs are in the Southern part of our city. That is work that is underway. There are, from the audience, um, there are questions. Uh, um, there's one question about the role of anchors institutions. You were just talking about the university. Um, people wanna know what is the role of anchor institutions in helping you build community wealth and place-based wealth? Either one I, of you. I, I don't mean to get in front of Mayor Reed. He's got more time uh, as mayor, so he can probably give you a more informed answer. But you know, anchor institutions is who's in uh, my line of sight 
or the housing question we talked about. You know, because in here in the city of San Diego, we build a lot of luxury housing. We have some progressive policies in place to build low income housing, but we are building next to nothing for working and middle class San Diegans. And that has to change. We can't be a great city if we don't have a thriving middle class. And so I see anchor institutions, businesses that are wonderful companies who create good paying jobs, but even their workers are hard pressed to find a home that they can afford, let alone buy in the city. I think in the way that we have seen large high tech companies in the Bay Area make uh, landmark gifts to try and address the housing crisis, we need to set up a middle income housing trust fund in San Diego. We've long had an affordable housing trust fund, but we should have a middle income housing trust fund where we can invite anchor institutions to make key investments, recognizing that their philanthropic contributions will ensure that the talent they work so hard to recruit and to retain in San Diego can actually stay here, build wealth and move forward. That is an area where I think anchor institutions can be transformative going forward. We are having those negotiations and discussions now. And again, it's one of those conversations that I cannot wait to be able to do more attention and more time to. Uh, and uh, stay tuned on that front. I hope to be able to make some good news in that space. Great. Mayor Reed, let me just ask you a different question. We actually have several questions from the audience about the role of arts. And I do think that with the EJ Institute, that you have and experience about the power of art in a community. Can you talk about that now? Absolutely, you know, through art we tell stories. Uh, we tell stories of promise, we, still, we tell stories of pain. And, you know, when we think about uh, the, the arts, it, it is a very uh, creative way, but a very important way of expressing oneself. Uh, and we have a thriving art scene through our museums, through our Alabama Shakespeare Festival, and certainly through our civil rights uh, museums and memorials that we have here. And so we tell a story about uh, not just Montgomery, Alabama, but of this nation. And we do it in a way that allows each individual to come away with, with their own interpretation of that. And it's something that we have felt uh, has been overlooked in the past, which is why under my administration, we stood up the Department of Cultural Affairs for that very reason. Because what we also recognized uh, was that there was a class divide. There was a race divide uh, between the symphony, uh, between the ballet, between our, um, you know, our, our plays and our theaters and those in the neighborhoods, those who were living one mile, three miles away who had never been uh, to any of these uh, institutions. And so we realized that we didn't want to uh, continue to play into that. What we wanted to do was to bring people together through the arts, to share various stories and to interact uh, with one another and certainly to, to have that space for our visitors and our tourists uh, that come here, you know, each year to learn more about uh, racial reconciliation, to learn more about uh, the civil rights movement and to learn more about the American South and this overall impact uh, in this nation as a whole. And so we're excited about our cultural affairs department and what the vision of our director has and we're looking to do more with that uh, to show a different side of, of Montgomery and the South itself and to really just talk more about America through uh, those entities that we have. Another question we've received from several of our audience, me me uh, audience members is about the future of children. And Mayor Reed, you already talked about your concern about the educational inequality or disparities that are gonna be exacerbated by COVID. So both of you, can you tell us, A, are your schools opened? And B, how you plan to help close those education gaps that may have been made worse by uh, this recession. Mayor Gloria, why don't you start? Sure. Um, no, our, uh, the majority of our schools are not open. We have had a, uh, uh, an inequitable situation where many of our private schools, some of our charter schools uh, have been open, but our public schools uh, to the large part are not. Uh, we do have a reopening date of April the 12th. Um, and I believe that we will make uh, that reopening date uh, with great appreciation to Governor Newsom, uh, as well as others for making that possible. Uh, this is, uh, it's critical. You know, we know that uh, online school is a sore substitute for in-person instruction, uh, and that it's difficult and possible to reopen our economy unless our schools reopen so that workers uh, can go back to work with confidence and not having to, to juggle things. On a go forward basis, you know, Amy, this is gonna be an area of some experimentation for our city. In San Diego, we have a separate elected school board. That is, this is their jurisdiction and their legal responsibility. But you'll never hear me wash my hands of any responsibility on public education. 
you can't build a great city without great public schools. And so whether it's working with our school districts and our teachers unions to try and get the schools reopened, which I believe we're on track to do, we have to take some of these lessons learned, these connections that have been made and use them to benefit our children going forward. We had a unique collaboration with our school district. It's literally a joint partnership with the city and the school district to build our new central library, which is in downtown. It's truly a palace for the people, a civic monument in our downtown community. That was possible because of collaboration between the city, municipal uh, corporation, and our school district. We need to do a lot more of that, and it should have accrued the benefit of our kids uh, who have really struggled this last year. Mayor Reed? Well, uh, like Mayor Glory, our schools are not open yet. Uh, students will go back at the beginning of April uh, to finish out the year. And I just talked with our superintendent yesterday, um, who, like Mayor Gloria, does not report to, to me, and nor do I appoint any school board members, just about what the plans were for the summer. And there will be summer academies that will be highly encouraged for students to try to make up ground um, throughout the summer. And, and it's my hope that we will get uh, the support that's needed in order to try to do what we can to close the gap. But that's also why we're trying to uh, work with other organizations um, that are looking to help, uh, you know, close those uh, educational divides that we have in any way possible. And certainly given what not only Montgomery and San Diego have dealt with, but all of this nation, if, if not uh, beyond, has dealt with through the pandemic has been how do you try to make this up. And I think by working with our uh, foundation institutions like our higher educational uh, schools that we have here, our K-12, as well as our community college, we're working through that as part of an education stakeholder group to come up with solutions for working adults, to come up with solutions for those that are also looking to reskill themselves and for those students who may have felt um, left behind and those parents who also are trying to grapple with uh, that same deficit on their end. Let me just close with one final question before we wrap up for today, which is that we now have an opportunity to forge a much more productive partnership with the federal government, with the arrival of the Biden-Harris administration, which will obviously be more friendly to cities and mayors than what we've seen in the last four years. Given all that you got on your plate, where can you just name one promising area of collaboration you hope to see with the Biden-Harris administration? Let's start with Mayor Gloria. Just one? <laughs> just one, I know. We're yeah. running out of time. I we know, could have spent more. I know. Um, let me just say, I, I uh, applaud the passage of the American Rescue uh, Act. And I think that the next step on infrastructure uh, could be truly helpful. We have a multi-billion dollar backlog for infrastructure in the, in the city. Federal partnership could help us uh, take care of that situation. We could use it as an incredible jobs program to put people back to work at a time when we have relatively high unemployment. And we could do it with both a climate justice lens and with an equity lens. I think that uh, not to be greedy because I'm super grateful for what has happened today with the president's signature on this bill. As we look at what's next, what have you done for me lately? Let's work on infrastructure. Let's have a transformative investment. We can match it with local dollars, put a lot of people to work and address some of that spatial uh, differential that you talked about before. Great, Mayor Reed. Uh, broadband access, you know, I, I think as Mayor Gloria pointed out earlier, that is so important. We, we see that digital divide that's impacting things from education to access to remote health care uh, to economic uh, mobility. That to me is one of the biggest things uh, from the city side that we could utilize. And I could go on with another long list as well, but that will probably jump out of the things that we that maybe I haven't mentioned uh, throughout this conversation. Well, listen, I, we could have kept on going with a lot of other topics that we didn't even get to. I wanted to ask you more about immigration reform, uh, Mayor Gloria, but we will have to invite you back to the Brookings platform. I want to thank all of you for tuning in for today. I think what you, I want to just close with where we began, which is that San Diego and Montgomery are two cities that absolutely represent our American future. And I hope that all of you who've tuned in today uh, got from this conversation that uh, our future is hopeful because of leaders like Mayor Gloria and Mayor Reed. I want to thank you both for your time today. I really do hope we stay in touch. And thank you all. Thank, thank you, Amy. Mayor, Mayor Gloria, you're welcome to Montgomery anytime. I'd love to see you in person soon. We'll do it. Look forward to it. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.